Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, I showed the same presentation yesterday at, uh, at the Family Chain Summit. So, uh, as this was uh, more a general introduction yesterday, I will go through the first slide a bit quicker and uh, focus a bit more on the actual uh, OTM implementation and the technical uh, design, uh, given the fact that we have people here in the in the room who actually understand the OTM terminology, which was maybe not uh, so the case yesterday. So, just to go through quickly who we are and what we do from Mazda. So, we are an independent Japanese car manufacturer with our headquarters in uh, Hiroshima, Japan. And we sell about 1.3 million units uh, a year. We have our main production is still in uh, Japan, Gofu and Hiroshima. Uh, we also have production in Thailand and China, and since last year, we also uh, have a production plant in Mexico, which is also delivering cars to Europe, mainly in Central Europe. Uh, quickly on our, on our vision, uh, and, and what we want to do is that we want to deliver quality cars, but we also want to deliver some customer experience that the cars are fun to drive, and there are sports cars like what we want is we also need to have the people behind it to fulfill this kind of uh, customer experience. If you look at us as a brand in the, in the, in the global industry, as I said, we are at uh, 1.3 million. Uh, our mid-term ambition is, is to go to 1.7 million. We don't want to be... Yeah, of course we want to be <laughs> I don't have to lie, but we, we don't have the intention to go to Toyota or VW with the 10 million sales. If we go to the 1.7, we would be right in between with the Mercedes-Benz and the BMWs of this, of this world, and that's actually what we are focusing on, becoming a premium brand uh, and, and, and be recognized as one of the premium brands in the Looking at our global sales, just to give you an idea of where we are selling our volumes, biggest volumes for North America, and then you see Japan, Europe, and China are more or less in line. And then the others are mainly uh, Asian markets and uh, Australia have historically a big market share of around 8%. What's very important for a car manufacturer are the products, of course. Um, we have a kind of design style which is represented in these three words, but this does not say a lot. So what I will show you is our actual lineup. We have a, a real challenging year this year, so we launched Mazda 3 last year, and we have uh, five launches this year, uh, of which three new models, completely new models, which is Mazda 3, uh, Mazda 2, sorry, uh, MX-5 and CX-3, which is a compact SUV, and we are uh, also launching the facelifts of our CX-5 and uh, Mazda 6, so actually a, a whole new uh, lineup uh, within uh, a year and a half uh, uh, launch time. A little bit on our philosophy because it's important um, to understand why Oracle fits into our uh, our strategy. We see there the five conventions: CC, TM, TB. Um, said it yesterday. Also, they they came up with this CC, TM, TB after being locked up for three days. Uh, okay, uh, maybe they should have locked them up a few more days to to come up with something else. But it, it, it's really representative for where we stand for. It says challenge convention to make things better. So, we are a brand in, in, in our history and also in recent examples who have never been following the rest of the world. So, I would like to give you some, some, uh, some historical facts and some recent, more recent facts to show you how, how we have been coping with these things. So, challenging convention, what you see there is the Mazda Cosmo, for example. Uh, which was launched with the rotary engine. So Mazda has the patent on the, on the rotary engine. And we have been developing it since the 60s up to uh, last year where we still had the RX-8 in production, uh, which had the rotary engine uh, for the technicians on the Mazda. So the rotary engine is, uh, has no pistons, has no moving parts. It's basically uh, two triangles uh, um, uh, working together, which uh, created the combustion two 650cc uh, So we have it's a very reliable engine because you don't have pistons and all those things that are breaking the normal engine. Because it's that, it was that reliable, we also use it for the mod. So we are still the one and only Japanese brand, the first and the only Japanese brand to ever win the mods. And then on the, on the right side you see kind of an icon of our 
founder, which is the MX5, which I think maybe also in the UK is a very well known uh, car. We are in the Guinness Book of Re uh, World Records for that one as a best selling roadster. So we started in, in the 90s with half a million, and now we are at 900,000, so we've got like a million car sales from this one. Looking at the challenging convention as a recent example, we have our Skyactiv technology. Um, we've seen in the market that all of the brands are focusing on lower emissions, uh, lower fuel consumption, and they all follow about the same track. So they downgrade their engines, they go to hybrid solutions, or they go to electric vehicles. But we at Mazda, we said, well, we don't really believe that these, these solutions will be a workable alternative within the next 10, 15 years. Um, in Belgium, for example, where I live, if, if you want to charge your electric car, you need to go to a McDonald's because that's the only place where you can, where you can charge your car. There's no infrastructure or whatever. So we said, let's do it differently. Let's focus on what we have today, which is our current combustion engine, and let's make that as efficient as a hybrid or, a, or an electric uh, combination or, or solution. And we did that by uh, moving the compression rate to 14 to 1 volt for the diesel and the gasoline. So for a gasoline normally it's much lower, for a diesel it's much higher. We put it at the same level. Why the 14 to 1? Because it gives you the most efficient combustion. Uh, uh, um, so with these products we are actually, we have lowered our fuel consumption to, I'm talking about engines which are 2 liter gasoline and 2.2 diesel. We are at levels where Competitors are need to use 1.5 or 1.4 uh, liter engines, and the power cars are still sports car. They are still fun to drive. They have big PK, so that's a good thing. We also we saw in the in with the competitors that every new model is getting bigger, getting more heavier. We have a have a kind of a strategy that we say for every new model we develop, it needs to be 100 kilowatt. So we need to use new materials for that. And this is also then beneficial for your emission and for your fuel consumption. And on the transmissions, that's more than to give it the sports car-like feeling, of course, that we have the, the swift transmissions in place. Focus a bit on logistics, which is uh, my part of the, of the job. So I'm responsible for the in- and outbound transportation of our spare parts in Europe. You see our facility here in uh, Willebroek. Um, and our mission statement. So what we do from Willowbrook basically is we are responsible not only for the parts supply and logistics but also for the vehicle logistics and we are also the back office Europe for Europe for IT and for accounting and we have our purchasing department there. Um, blue the figures on it, we have a warehouse surface of about 50,000 square meter and we have it all the time around 75 to 80,000 different parts in stock directly available for the teams when they work. The fill rate there is about 96%. We are up to 97, 98% at this stage of the reason. But 98% of the parts that the dealer orders today, he can get it direct from the shelf from our warehouse. So, uh, looking at our logistics then, because that's important on, on uh, when we look a bit further to our OTM uh, implementation. So, to be, to be clear, we did not implement, implement OTM for our vehicle distribution, but we did it for our spare parts logistics. But just looking at our vehicle distribution, um, we get all the cars in by PCC, so car carriers from Japan, 44,500 cars on the boat. They go to Antwerp, Zurbrugge, Barcelona, and are then distributed to dealers from there. That's how our network looks like. You see also Zerubino there. The reason why I want to, to look at our vehicle network is all because we also see there in logistics that we're kind of a uh, challenging convention. We were also the first brand to bring cars from Japan to Vladivostok, put them on the Trans-Siberian Railway, and brought them from somewhere at the right of the screen there, directly to Moscow in 10 days. So let's say there's a lead time of 30 to 25 days, and we were the first brand to, uh, to do that. If you look at our parts distribution network, so you see that we are uh, here in the middle in, uh, in Belgium with, uh, with uh, uh, Wielbrook, all the countries in yellow, 
they are served directly from us and they are all direct dealer deliveries so that means that we pick, we pack all dealer lab. Um, most of our setup is with fixed contracts, fixed carriers so we have fixed trucks a day for a country defined on historical volume plus a kind of a buffer we ship the goods out today all the dealers have to kind of cut off until they can place their last order and then we guarantee them that they get the parts overnight so what we will uh, do with the LTM for our outbound is actually plan the first leg which is from Emily to the hub of the carrier and the second leg it will also be created in OTM but we are not going to plan on that we leave it up to the carriers we, we think they have sufficient background to do this planning in the most optimal way and they can combine with other brands we're not asking for dedicated network services or middle brands so we are really interested in monitoring the first leg of the transportation and we have the second leg of the transportation mainly for in OTM mainly for cost purposes to, uh, to be able to do the saddle building and to have a track and trace option on the afterwards. The blue colors you see we have an RDC in Austria which we deliver on, on a daily basis with stock and they do that distribution to all the surrounding countries plus Italy and Turkey and we also have an RDC in Russia. Um, so I rushed a bit through this because I wanted to spend some more time on, on how the actual implementations work, so the actual projects at, uh, at Mazda. Um, looking back at our vision and saying that we really want to work on this customer experience and, and be reliable and have parts there on time and, and make sure that everything is, is there when it's needed, we had a kind of challenges within our IT and our logistics to, to, to get there. Uh, we had a home, we still have a homegrown WMS system which is created for us uh, at a certain time in the 80s and on which we have built and customized and made it suitable for our job during the last uh, 20 years but it had no transport management model so we all did these kind of things a little bit manual, a little bit with other applications but no single system who could manage everything that we can do with our WMS. We also have a quite complex logistics or complex, very specific logistics. So on the, on the first implementation we did for OTM, the inbound, it was a completely new flow. So we said, okay, we need to have a kind of system who can support this new flow. That was on the inbound side. On the outbound side, as I told you, we have this specific overnight deliveries to dealers which are I, I heard um, the people from Minos about talking about transport optimization for us that was not the main driver to go to OTM because as I said we have fixed trucks on a daily basis because you cannot say this on, on a day okay six o'clock in the evening the UK dealer can place his order until 6 o'clock in the evening. Mm. We have now about one and a half truck. We need to get it to the hub. Let's go onto the market, send out a tender to our different carriers and see who's the cheapest to bring it tonight to a hub. And then we send another tender to see who can deliver it still over route to hub. So it's kind of specific. So we have fixed routings, fixed contracts, fixed agreements. Uh, that's how we set up our deals. And as I said, uh, our customer experience. So we wanted to monitor and have more visibility on our complete chain so that we could inform, instead of getting an email in the morning when the dealer opens its night and doesn't find its parts, we want to inform them in front and say, okay, look, we know this part is not going to be there, but you will have it at 10 o'clock. So you can reschedule some of your appointments or you can repair one part before the other or whatever. What was the strategy that, that our HQ uh, went on uh, a few years ago? They said, well, we have all these entities and, and all of them have different logistics challenges. Um, let's look at a, a software which can offer a solution which is flexible and has all the necessary modules 
which should allow every entity in, in our Muslim world to tackle these logistics uh, uh, issues. So they said, we're going to provide the licenses for all, to all our entities, and whenever there is a need to develop uh, uh, a logistics uh, solution, you can use Oracle uh, for, your, for your solution. And by that, we could then create worldwide some competence centers because in Europe we're not mainly focusing on DM implementation, but in Thailand, uh, Australia, they are because of WMS implementation. So there's a kind of a, a kind of a competence we, we are creating all over the world, which we then can use across the Muslim world. Um, then on the actual implementations, so as I said, we have first the inbound flow, which is the parts consolidation center. I'll explain later how it works. There we use the EBS module for uh, order and exemplary. Part of the WMS mainly for unloading, staging, and loading of the goods. And then OTM for the inbound tender to bring the goods from local suppliers to us, and for the outbound tender to bring the goods from our warehouse to the production facilities in Japan and Mexico. And the second project, which we are now in the middle of deploying, is then for our uh, outgoing service parts to the dealers. So there we are using OTM, and for both projects we are using SOA as an interface uh, to make the uh, interfaces between all the uh, different uh, programs. So, on PCC first, um, parts consolidation center. So, Mazda Japan is ordering parts at European suppliers, which they will use in their production facilities. And they have assigned Emily Mazda Bluebook as their consolidation center. What do we do? We pick up parts at European suppliers. The orders are coming into EBS. The supplier is announcing to us when goods are ready. We are feeding them dimensions, volumes, weights, number of pallets, and so on. It creates an ASM to OTM. We inbound tender all these shipments. OTM selects our preferred carrier. And let's say Thursday, Friday, Monday, we do all the inbound tenders, and then we have an overview on when all these goods will be coming in during the week. At that moment we do a second build plan and we do an outbound time. Because we are shipping the goods then by, if they go by sea, in consolidated containers to the Japan production and to the Mexico production site. So at that point we do an outbound tender, OTM calculates how many containers we will need, which parts will go into which container, and we have in our warehouse staging lines, which represent a container. So, at the moment that the goods are getting into our warehouse, starting as of Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, for Friday shipment onto the container, the group which is coming up at our dock, we release the unloading sheet, the guy unloads the goods, he gets directly the label with the information to which staging line he has to put it, and to which position. So every uh, incoming uh, goods are already put into the staging line on the position that they will go out into the container. On the Friday, we put the empty containers on the dock. The guy goes to the staging line, we say staging line MCA is related to this container, and he starts loading the container exactly as the pallets are put into the staging line. So, as I said, where you can see here, this is actually the whole integration. So you see EBS communicating with, via the SOA, with OTM. Um, the WMS creating uh, via the SOA to OTM, and vice versa. So this is actually the uh, technical uh, integration. This is what I said earlier. So we consolidate all the goods. We send them out by uh, container on the air order. So if Japan really urgently needs an order, we uh, instruct the carrier to pick it up at the supplier, go to the nearest airport and send it by air. All this uh, is also being fit back to OTM, so the uh, carriers are informing us that air bill number, ETA, ETD, and so on. 
uh, this project we implemented um, in 2013. So that was the first uh, OTM project. The lessons learned there, they are very much in line with what um, uh, Unilever also said uh, this morning. So it's very important that you you choose wisely and a portable partner that you have the good people on site who understand logistics. Um, another thing is resources, what we also saw with Unilever today. You easily underestimate the resources you need to set up uh, this kind of system, and specifically on the business side. Because on the IT side, you, you, have, you usually have your project uh, uh, managers on IT side who, who take these kind of uh, projects in hand. But on the business side, you have to, you know, it, it just comes on top of the daily business. So it's not easy to combine your daily business with running an, an, an OTM implementation. And what we also saw in the regular waterfall um, project is that sometimes the time between getting the requirements and getting the actual product when you then get the actual product, it's sometimes a big surprise that you need to go back to the requirements and say, was this what we asked for? So, that was not fully... It's, it's not just on the, on the, on the, on the uh, IT side, it's also on the business side that the others occur, but sometimes it doesn't work like that. The so, in the SPE project, which we are currently uh, going through, we wanted to do it a bit differently from the, from the lessons we learned from, uh, from the PCC project. So our s project, why we are implementing uh, OTM, is actually, as you can see there, there's an efficient and effective transportation management solution that provides transparency, visibility, accurate calculations, as well as decision-making for the optimal logistics solution for transporting goods across the MD very long sentence uh, we do there. The actual basis, as I said, we didn't have a transportation. And we wanted to have a product that could replace everything that we were doing now manually, to have a, one, uh, one system in place that could be managed by our IT and that could replace all of this kind of uh, things. We gave us for that 12 months, plus one month of pre-study, and another month to solve uh, issues after uh, release two. We worked in, in two releases, so release one, I will share the details a bit later, was mainly on planning, tendering, uh, booking, and release two is more on documentation, on uh, settlement and tracking trends. That's a bit how it was uh, divided. In the lessons learned, you saw that we were not very happy with the waterfall approach we chose in the previous project, so that's why we went with the agile approach. And uh, it was touched already this morning also uh, with uh, the picture of the scrum. Um, the idea of, of, of agile approach is to slice the full project into chunks which are delivered on a monthly basis. So we chose for monthly sprints. We had all our user stories written by the product owner, which was me in this case. And on every new sprint, we sat together and we made a sprint plan. A very important person in that one is the Scrum Master. He was uh, 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 heading a team of Maven uh, Wire who did the implementation with us. And he is really doing all the administration, follow up. Uh, organizing the daily scrums, organizing meetings if necessary between the teams. He is really the link between Mazda IT, Mazda Business, and the Maven Wire development. So every month we sat together, we defined the targets in the, in the sprint plan. And then we had a daily scrum. So, as, as this morning shown in the picture, we just stood in one room if they were on site, or organized uh, an audio if some people were not on site. And everybody said, okay, I'm working on that, I'm gonna do that. Do you have any impediments? Is there an issue that we need to raise? No? Okay. Just shortly telling what you were doing, we are still on track to deliver what we have agreed, 
and whether somebody needed, needed to help you with something, that's what you do on a daily basis. And then, at the end of the sprint, you do kind of a review, to say, okay, these were the things we wanted to deliver in this sprint, what if we now actually achieve? And you do a retrospective. What have we done good? What can go better? Is there an issue in communication? Do we need to have people more on site? Those were all the things you need to you need to work on. Because I can tell you in the first sprint, <laughs> you will never believe in what you have planned for. Unless you, you you need to estimate really on at the start it's a bit it's difficult to estimate how long things will take. But you can bet. Every time you get better, you have your retrospective, you improve things, and it gets better. And now we are at a stage where our, our first sprint planning took a day, and now our seventh sprint planning took two hours. Because you are getting used to the, to the agile approach. So the main thing is that as a business then, speaking for me, you get early hands-on to the actual product. Because you're developing it in chunks instead of getting it after one year as a full product in, in one go and then you have to look what is now available and so So that's the main, uh, the main advantage of this. This is how, uh, how the integration uh, architecture looked like for our SPE project. So I said we had a homegrown WMS and we kept all the functionalities of that one. So OTM is communicating with our PA, it's called, that's our homegrown system, is also communicating with SAP for our cell building and settlement solution, and is also communicating with DigiCMR for the creation of our digital CMR as part of the documentation that we want to run via OTM. And all of this is going over the SOA, which is also all set up by a This is then how the integration looks like for uh, in schedule for, for the SPE project. So as I said, you have PNA, SAP, all integrated via SOA, and then communication with uh, OTM and DGC. I'll go to a bit more details uh, later on. I just want to show you the full SPE flow, which we are covering via OTM. Um, Gives you a kind of an overview. It goes from all the orders, secure resources, confirmed resources. We have the dot door scheduling there. Then we have the load confirm and the truck is there. We create all the documents. We get track and trace on uh, status of our goods. After the uh, transport has been handled, we will set up the financials. We do post, uh, cost postings to SAP. We do sell building as we have an agreement with the carrier, or we do a matching of invoices if there's an agreement. And in the end, everything that we did or do today with all different applications, Excel and Access and other things, are now all handled in one flow with OTM uh, at the center. So, as I said, we had two releases. On the release one, this is how the solution uh, looks like. So, we have our dealers ordering goods. As I said, they all have cutoffs. For example, the Belgian dealer can order it at 4 o'clock and he, can, he gets that as part a guaranteed order. We are capturing the transmission when the cutoff comes in, in PNA, and that data is sent directly to OTAN. So these are the process cutoff orders. They create order movements in OTM, which we can the second transmission we are getting from PNA is the shipping mark. That's when the goods are actually packed in an overpack. So with these two transmissions, we are able to do our planning and our uh, resource planning. So because this gives us the option to already order transport based on a cutoff without even having one part packed. We have in our system, how do we do that? We have a kind of a, uh, a packing parameter. Uh, so if a large part is coming out, then we say, okay, the packing will be about plus 20%. If a very small part is coming out, it will be much higher because we'll put it in a blue box. So when a cutoff comes out, it gives us already an idea on the estimation. 
and we can already order transport even before one part is planned. The second one, when there's a closed case, we can actually, yeah, as everybody does, this also creates an order movement which we can use then uh, to order uh, transport but based on actual ship units. What I also said is that we have a lot of fixed transporters and depending on which volume we will load on them. For those, we use the ground schedules and to be able to, to tender these shipments there is already always a dummy order on the shipment that allows us to also tender or order trucks without assigning any actual order movement to it. So those are the three options we have to do our uh, uh, resource planning. Um, so then the tendering process just follows the, the normal uh, uh, OTM flow. We tender, the carrier can respond via the portal uh, or via the link in the email, respond to accept the tender, fill in the, uh, the license plate. And at that time also the truck is planned in the dock door plan. So we are using the dock door planning to give us a visual overview of per dock. We can see all the slots, which trucks are, in, are planned in there. And we have uh, installed uh, big screens now in our warehouse, so for the loading people, they have now a complete visual on what they can expect at which dock, at what time, for which country. So this gives us quite a, a good visibility of what is planned for the next day. Um, maybe to give you an idea on the volumes, we have about 90,000 order lines a week, which we do, and we have about 40 trucks a day, which we have. 40 trucks, it can be FDL, it can be boxed fans, it can be sprinters. 40 shipments on average a day going out and 90,000 order lines a day, a uh, week, sorry. So that is up to the dock door planning. Uh, and then we have a third um, transmission coming from our PNA system, and that is actually when the goods are loaded. When the goods are loaded, we do the invoicing in our PA. And that is kept in our current WMS because behind that is all the invoicing of the parts to the NSCs, to the national sales companies, but also the creation of the dealer invoices, our inventory ledger, and so on. So that is all kept into uh, PA. But at that time, we are linking the shipment ID from OTM with the W number, which is our reference in PA, so that the goods that are invoiced are directly linked to the shipment in OTM. It's our output. So that is release one, the planning. So basically it's order management, transportation planning, transportation booking, putting it visible in the dock door, and then up to the confirmed load in PNA that the truck is actually loaded and that the shipment is closed in OTM. That's our first release which we have rolled out mid of January and which we are now working with uh, in you see here, rates management and hazardous. Uh, we are using the Evolve um, um, solution from uh, Mavenbuy for that one, so that we can upload rates into OTM, and we have also used it to upload all the uh, all the data for our hazardous materials into OTM. So the UN codes, flashpoint, uh, packing uh, category, all these things. They are uploaded via the Evolve. Uh, two, and this also allows us, so whenever there's a cutoff, it all automatically tells us how many hazard points it has. So the thousand rules, thousand points rules, we're also, uh, Unilever was referring to, at that time you need a full RDF trick. Well, it shows us already from the cutoff whether there's a chance that we would need a full RDF trick because of this. Uh, on SOA, uh, talking on the interfaces then, so you have the planning orders, you have the card already, when the case is uh, packed, you have the shipment ID, which is fed from OTM to PNA, then you have the load confirm, which is then linking the PNA reference with the shipment ID, and you have all the acknowledgement, which was set up as a main deliverable in release 1. Now, release two, where we are now uh, working on, is more on execution of the transport settlement. Um, so, 
when the transport, where we were uh, at the end of the release one is that the transport is load confirmed in PMA. So the truck is loaded, everything is on there, the shipment is closed in OTM, we know what's on the line. At that moment, of course, we need to start generating all the documents, uh, CMR, hazmat documents, shipping instructions to the, to the carriers and to the dealers. Uh, that is what we do at that stage. So we will set the uh, shipment and route status in OTM, and at that moment we will have the interface going to DigiCMR, which is a solution which can create digital CMRs instead of, I don't know how the, the regulation is in the UK, but in Belgium only the federation is allowed to indicate who can give you numbers for creating CMR. So normally it is really on a big box of paper with numbers from 1 to 5,000. In this case, there are also a few uh, companies who can do it digitally in Belgium who are allowed to do that, and we have engaged one of these companies. So OTM is sending all the necessary data to complete the CMR to DigiCMR, and our CMR is created digitally. Um, what is also in there is uh, tracking. So, there was a bit of a difficulty there. We are not interested in tracking our shipments. We are sending goods from MLE to a hub. For us, we don't care whether it gets there three hours later or three hours and ten minutes later or two hours and fifteen minutes later. But we, for us, important is the second leg or the next leg of the transport, that is that the dealer gets the parts in time. So we are looking really at getting uh, tracking events for our dealer deliveries. So that is also going to be set up in uh, release two. And then on settlement, uh, we spend a lot of time during the first days of the month in, in uh, giving provisions to our uh, accounting, to set up settlement billing, all calculations which were actually being done by operational people during their normal job. So we wanted to really automate that. And for that we set up all the transport settlement uh, in OTM. So we will have um, all shipments and the shipment costs showing on the surf prof for the carrier. So you can check it during the month already which costs we will allow to bill us. If he does not send any, any remarks, at the second or the third day of the month, we will make a consolidated invoice. This amount of the consolidated invoice is going to our SAP, as a, as a GL cost, uh, cost posting, and at the same time, we'll feed our summary billing to create the invoice for the carrier. If the carrier, because also there are some legal requirements and agreements you need to make between the company Carrier. If the carrier does not agree to have a seller billing, we will set up kind of a, a matching uh, method where we say okay, the GL cost posting is there for X amount. If the carrier sends the invoice itself and it corresponds to the GL, then it's also a, a match and we continue in the same, uh, in the same way. Um, so that's how, how the... Another thing we will do is in the company recharging. So for some of our NSCs we are recharging the cost to the NSC, so we will use the buy and sell uh, side for OTM to cover that. So we will have the buy side, which will uh, be the cost of the carrier, and the sell side can then be with an addition of administration costs or whatever, uh, also used to recharge uh, the NSC in that case. So what were the deliverables in release two? So the next leg is what I said is actually the lag from the hub to the deal that will be created. Uh, the rates management, the shipment creation for the next leg, and then all the transportation documents. So we will create the CMR via the interface, but we will also create all the hazmat documents based on the info that we had done in release one via the evolve. So we have all the data in there, and these hazmat documents will just be a kind of a resume of what is loaded on the truck and also a overview per deal that is loaded on the truck for the distribution to the, to the dealer. And then we will also generate uh, shipping instructions in OTM 
these are mainly an overview for the carrier with tells of per dealer which colony he will get with our unique numbers and these unique numbers we will ask uh, we will use for track and trade also so every unique number is an actual delivery to the dealer which we will monitor for the performance of the transport so that we will do in tracking events and then we will also set up the transport settlement so the seller billing the invoicing the assignment of the GL codes and the VAT calculations plus the intercompany charge. Uh, the interfaces you can see on the on the right side, so they are all to fulfill all the uh, deliverables we had on the, on the left side. Also. So what is the status now? So as I said, we have uh, in January delivered release one. We are now actually rolling out all our countries, um, setting them up. Also something that was said this morning. Make sure that your master data setup is good. Um, what we are using to cover all our different cutoffs, so we are setting up order schedules, we are setting up ground schedules for our fixed shipments, and then we are setting up itineraries to link all these order schedules and the ground schedules together. It's very important that you have a good setup or your power plan will just fail on every or to the wrong thing. So test it thoroughly, set it up correctly, set up good procedures to set it all up and then it will, it will go very smoothly. But it needs to be done right from the first time because afterwards trying to look for an error is much more difficult than having a good procedure in place. So release 2 is ongoing. We are now in sprint uh, 8. Yeah. So uh, another uh, 4 sprints to go. So delivery mid of May. And then uh, we should have a full solution covering all of the, what we needed uh, to have from, uh, from OTM. So we are still on time, we are still on budget, we are still on scope. Um, what are the lessons we have learned so far from the SPE project? I don't know where I am on time. I think I'm still Ten minutes. Ten minutes, okay. Um, A good cooperation between IT and business and the development team is really necessary. I, I was happy to hear that also this morning from you, from you Dan, but I think most of the things that you see in the lessons learned are, are coming back and, and everybody has about the same problems and the same issues. So it's really important that it's not only a IT project in OTM implementation or only a business project really need to work together and be aligned on what the outcome of the solution will bring you. Because on either side you need to be convinced that this is the right direction you are taking. And if one of these parties is going another way then it's just not workable. So you need to have a really good uh, cooperation. You have to have the people on site which is also very, very important. Um, if you only work with people who are reachable by audio or video or in a different time zone, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. We have them uh, at our site three days a week. So all the main developers from Mavenwire are on site three days a week. And that is really, really, really helping us. If you have an issue, you can stop by the in the meeting room, you can stop by and discuss. If they have a requirement or an urgent need for something, because they can't proceed with something, just drop by by my desk and we can go through it. So it's really important to have good cooperation but also to have them on site and have a fixed project team. Then on the agile approach, it's a bit scary at first because you need to trust your, your other people in the project that they will do what they have promised to deliver. And because they are all working on a specific part of the full solution that will only be visible at the end of the month, it's sometimes difficult to follow up, but with the daily scrums and, and the more you get into it, it's really a good, a good, uh, really good solution. And we got already, after three or four months, even earlier, demos on how the product would look like in production, which gave us a, a, 
a much better view on how it would it would uh, would evolve. Because one of the things that, for me at least, was also uh, uh, very very difficult at the start is that the terminology in OTM. Every company has its own terminology, and the shipment, the ship unit, an order release, an order movement in OTM does not mean the same on our side. So what, what we, to, to get really to that terminology and, and have the people from Maverick say, oh yeah, that's an uh, order movement and that will be a ship unit, to really link that to what it is actually means in your company, that's also an, an important thing uh, that, that you need to do and, and that you only can, can learn when you also already have early access to, to the system on uh, where to find it and how to it. Like. And then also another thing that is also already said this morning, avoid over customization. Uh, what we did in, in our approach was we had a big as is document had a big to be document. But whenever we started designing the to be solution, we always looked at what is available standard in OTM. We never started from we want this, 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 this. No, we said, okay, what is standard available in OTM? We see, we match our business process, and of course we did make some, some changes, but we really, really avoided to go into an over-customization, which was also one of the lessons we learned from, from uh, ECC. So, another lesson learned, and this is the last one then, is have sufficient manpower, both on business and IT side, to do all the testing, to do the follow-up, to do the setup of the master data, because it's really time consuming if you want to do this correctly. So, what are the benefits? Transport optimization. I'm not going to put a percentage on that one. As I said, we have really fixed contracts at the moment. We have fixed trucks which are in contracts for two to three years. So the transport optimization will really only come after we have some historical data in our system, which will allow us to align our fixed transports with reality. What we have done with OTM is create a kind of a platform for future growth. And we are working now still with uh, the CART, for example, as a separate uh, customs act, uh, uh, application. We saw today in, in the slides also that there is a possible integration with GTM and Ricard. So we can build on this OTM solution and further roll it out. We have now OTM on the inbound, we have OTM on the outbound, so it could make sense to do also the in between the double um, What was a, a real benefit also is that it reduced a lot of manual effort at our side. Uh, only the settlement, as I said, it was about four days with different people to get this one in place. If it works as it's designed at the moment, it will be just a push of the button. The details and the amounts will all be there. Um, we will only have one system. So for IT, it's much better to have one system than to have multiple systems, some of them set up by users. We will have historical data in OTM, so we can use it also as a sourcing solution uh, later on when we do our tendering. And our setup is future-proof because we have always put SOA in between for the interfaces. So we can easily, if we would change PNA to a WMS solution, we can just swap the PNA, do the interfaces from the WMS, and all the other existing interfaces could just uh, exist further on. So that what I already said is we will look into further using the ARPA system within MLE and also globally, of course, and we can use the competence that we have built up now in OTM for further on So, thank you for uh, listening to it, and I hope it was a bit clearer. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah.